Hi everyone, as I mentioned, I am Lucia Kula. I'm a lecturer in the law department. I'm a lecturer in law and gender, and I'm also currently finishing my PhD in the law department. I've been at SOAS for the past uh, seven years, almost eight. I came to SOAS to do my master's, I have a law background from the Netherlands, and I came to SOAS to do a master's in human rights, conflict and justice. And I stayed on to do my PhD in international law, which I'm currently finishing. I've been teaching at SOAS for the past three years. So today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how law, um, how we perceive law at SOAS, so at least how we teach some aspects of law and what may interest you to join uh, the law school at SOAS. And I see that my colleague Michelle has also joined. Great. <laughs> She's waving. So I'm going to give you a very brief presentation on looking at how we uh, teach some aspects of law within the law department but also uh, to maybe uh, trigger your ideas around what we think about when we think about law, what are the ideas that we have around law and how can we expand those of the ideas a little bit more. I'm gonna just start sharing my presentation. Hold on. And it may be that I disappear if I put the presentation on full screen. So that happens like that. So my presentation today is about law, what it is and what it ought to be. So what is law and what, the, and what do we think law should look like? When we think about law, we often think probably around criminal law, we think about tort, we think about property law, commercial law, all aspects of uh, law that have a direct effect on our daily lives, right? But we don't really think about what law actually is, what makes law legitimate, and what is its function. So what do we need to understand about law to be able to say that we are, we are law-abiding citizens or that we are in a society that takes into consideration not only how law affects us, but what our rights are as well. So to start to talk about law, we also need to consider what law actually is and what it means for so our understanding of law is very much centered on this idea on things that we see in our society, the way law is taught at school, and the way we perceive our rights and responsibilities within our society. But that shapes our idea of what law ought to be or what law is as well. Because we are in the, in, in the West, we are in the, in the UK, it's this conceptual idea of what law looks like is very much centered around our societal interaction, but also how our values and our norms. So when we think about law, we also have to think about how law looks like in different parts of the world. It's one of the aspects that we look at when you're studying law at SOAS, for example. So um, Kenneth Nunn, for example, is a legal scholar, argues that our idea of law, particularly the way we look at it in the West, is very Eurocentric. He says that meaning, he says, he describes law as a Eurocentric enterprise meaning that law is part of a broader cultural endeavor that attempts to promote European values and interests at the expense of all others. Law carries out a Eurocentric program as it organizes and directs culture. Law does this by reinforcing a Eurocentric way of thinking, promoting Eurocentric values, and affirming, indeed, celebrating the Eurocentric cultural experiences. So if we think that law is a Eurocentric concept, particularly the way we practice law in the West, then what are other things that we need to consider when we think about law? And what are the things that we are missing when we don't take in the cultural um, aspects of uh, geographical or regional, regional interactions in our society? So when we think about law, we really also have to think about how it affects our interaction with each other, but also how it affects our rights, right? So how it affects the way that law is not only affirming our needs, but also affirming the needs that, for example, the government needs to provide for us. So when we look at law, we also need to see it as an instrument, a legal instrument that is able to not only give us rights, but also grant us certain responsibility when it comes to aspects of those rights. So law is and should be an instrument that serves social individual interests, but it can also be a catalyst for progressive social and progressive social change and transformation. And the way we can see that is the way law has been used in the past and currently to affirm certain rights, but also to limit aspects of rights and movement of certain groups in, in different parts of the world. We see that 
law as a legal instrument can be used for the benefit of society, but it can also introduce dangers in the way that it reproduces this notion of uh, discrimination and inequality. We can see those dangers, for example, if you look at Jim Crow laws in the United States, the Nuremberg, Nuremberg laws in former Nazi Germany, and the apartheid legal order in South Africa. But we see the benefit it's the counter aspect of that, and for example, constitutional bills of rights that have been introduced in many parts of the world, but also anti discrimination and equalities law that guarantee that people should be treated equally. They guarantee that you should be treated equally, but they don't always reaffirm that notion. So, international human rights law is an aspect that then introduces us aspect of what we think is universal, what, what, what are some aspects of universal rights so that we all should be. Um, um, in a, a derogation. So when we look at law as a legal instrument, we also need to consider that, particularly when we look at, for example, human rights law, we're saying that not only does law need to provide us protection, security, and other aspects of how we enjoy life in our society, but also law also guarantees us that we can go to uh, legislators to affirm these rights, right? So, why is it important and to focus on human rights? Why is it important to be able to say that law is not only providing certain aspects of how we navigate our society and how society is then able to cater to our needs, but it's also because it reaffirms those notions around, for example, non-discrimination and equality, making sure that there is no distinction between how people are treated based on their sexual orientation, their gender, their, um, uh, their religious belief, uh, et cetera, et cetera. But also, it also introduces this aspect of particularly focusing on the protection of women, for example, when it comes to violence against women. We can do that, we can look at that from a domestic perspective, but we can also look at that in aspects of conflict. So how, in what way does law offer these protections? And we can also look at how law reinforces notions around social political rights. So maybe such as health care, etc. And housing rights benefiting from the idea that every, per every person has the right to have access to housing. And then sexual reproductive, reproductive rights, so we can see that is an ongoing debate, even in, within the Western context. If you, for example, look at the United States, the southern, uh, southern part of the United States, Texas, where really sexual reproductive rights are an ongoing debate along how women's bodies should be treated and who has the right to speak on these issues, right? And then forced displacement, of course, we see with conflict comes forced displacement, it comes with the movement of people, people trying to escape violence, trying to seek asylum. So what does the law tell us about that? How do people have the right to, for example, seek asylum? Who is being a refugee? Who is considered a refugee and within what context? And of course, we also have the issues around labor rights. So, for example, how old you are supposed to be when you start working, what aspect of child labor rights are considered in different parts of the world, uh, exploitation of labor rights, all of these things play a significant role in how we view law and how we understand law to function within our society. But it shows us as well that not only is it important to consider that law creates sites of power and privileges, but it also reaffirms certain ideas that we have around our society, particularly when we look at it from the context of a Western society looking into the global South, for example. We can see ideas around cultural essentialism, that women in the third world, for example, are portrayed as victims of their culture, which reinforces the stereotypes and racist representation of that culture and privileges the culture of the West. The legal scholar Ratna Kapoor was written and um, done a lot of research around how women, particularly in the global South, are viewed from a Western perspective. But it also means that if we look at law, we don't introduce certain aspects of, for example, gender, that gender without the attention to colonial genealogies reproduces gender as an element of imperialism, as a civilizing project. So seeing law as a way to reinforce that colonial project that saw the majority of the global south, the majority of the countries that were colonized as uncivilized and uh, primitive nations that needed to be reintroduced, needed to be introduced to Africa.
aspects of law and good governance. So we see when sites of power and privilege are introduced to aspects of societies where there's a different understanding of what law ought to be, particularly when it comes to, for example, religious law, then it creates conflict. And we need to then consider how law then is often navigated through the perspective of how not only women are viewed, but also other marginalized groups and what that means for the representation of legal reforms in that sense, right? So when we talk about, for example, the ideas of including more aspects of how law affects women's lives, how law affects particularly those who are already marginalized within our society, it's really important to consider aspects such as intersectionality. Intersectionality, in a way, challenges the law to look at the social marginalization of women's experiences, the disparities of the theory and the practice of race and gender in law. So particularly how race and gender within the Western context initially did not take into consideration, consideration that race and gender could be a significant way of looking at people's lived experiences and how law affects them. Challenging the essentialist views and power differentials in human rights, so it's also an aspect of what intersectionality does. So making sure that we view how important it is to see that there is, there is this conflict where sites of power interact, and particularly when it comes to those who are already marginalized, it is important to view that, to, to view the context of that power. So without intersectionality, we reinforce the gender binary and embed other sources of privilege. So without intersectionality, we tend to look at people's lives as one dimensional. We tend to think that law actually is applicable to all in society in the same way, not considering that certain aspects of law will have different effects on different groups of people. So the reason why intersectionality is so important is because intersectionality requires us to ask questions of our own privilege and assumptions in law particularly how we understand law and what law is and how law then is represented to us. So when we look at ideas around what law is and what law should be, we also need to consider aspects of how we do not uh, live single issue, line, issue lives as other laws here said. There's no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives, meaning that there is no way that we can just look at law without contextualizing that every individual person's experiences will be different. It's not to say that we need to cater each law to every individual, but there are certain aspects of taking into consideration that certain groups in our society, for example, women, black people, uh, people from a different faith, etc., will have a different interaction with the law. And what that does, and what that then does is then mitigating around how we explain those differences, but also how we probably explain cultural clashes when law does not take into consideration that we are a multicultural society. And then we're taking different aspects of all these different groups and how they interact within our society to make a more equitable uh, environment. So what law is and what it ought to be, some, some of the things that are challenging, so some of the aspects that we look at, particularly within the context of looking into the global south, looking into different parts of the world, and depending on whether you're doing undergraduate studies or postgraduate studies, you're going to go into more in-depth analysis of what law should look like or what law is in that context, particularly, for example, how it affects women, how it affects uh, queer people, how it affects those who are marginalized within the context of society and are lacking representation. So when we think about law, we also need to look at society, we need to look at culture, we need to look at how we interact within that society and what it means to actually say that we live in a society that caters to most of our needs, particularly if we are not part of the norm and we then take into consideration the majority of the people that are affected negatively but our assumptions of law are those who are not part of the law. Thank you. Any questions? Get out of the presentation.
Thanks so much, Lucia. Is that the end of the presentation? Excellent. Um, students, do you have any questions with respect to what Lucia was then was just discussing there? Unfortunately, she has to leave us shortly, and then I'll give you an overview of the School of Law and what it's like to study undergraduate law at SOAS. Um, but we wanted to start off with one of our big ideas, which is really intersectionality and the way in which as law students and law scholars, we have to think about what it means and who law is empowering at various points. Are there any questions for Lucia before she leaves? So one of the ideas that we need to do think about when you're studying undergraduate law, you probably come to um, university thinking that you're only going to be looking at court law, property law, etc. When you come to service, it's a little bit different. We have modules that particularly look at, for example, the legal systems in parts of Asia and parts of Africa, and what law and how law is represented, represented in those parts of the world particularly our understanding of law or your understanding of law will be expanded. This is one of the benefits of not only studying at SOAS, but also thinking about law from a wider perspective. So not only the limitations of what we look at law within our Western society, but also considering how law affects different parts of the world, particularly when we look at the colonial interference in, in history. Great, thank you. Well, if there are no questions for Lucia then, thank you Lucia for that, that's fantastic. Um, I might ask then to start our discussions together today before I go on to another presentation, but because I want to make sure you're all uh, up and, and awake at the moment, why, why do you want to study law? What's motivating you to come to this talk today? If you could just put a few lines in the chat for me, that would be great. Yes, men. I'm very passionate about social justice and wish to see change. Hmm. I think that's true of pretty much all of the people that are going to be working in the department and that will be teaching you. Um, as I'll, I'll illustrate when I show you the school, but that's a great reason to be studying law. Yes, men. Thank you for sharing. Mariko, as I can deal with world problems from a perspective of trying to help people. Again, that shows a real sense of law as being in service to people, as law as problem solving. And I think as a lawyer, that is really the central focus of your degree. It's a lot about understanding the causes of problems. Why are these things happening? Why is this particular defendant being held accountable, criminally responsible for this particular act and, and what is the cause of that? So we look both at the, the individual causes and also the society that brings such things about. Samuel tells us, I just find the idea of law and how it affects society interesting. Yeah, that's a fantastic reason to come to law. Uh, I think law is, uh, the, it's, as our head of school so often says, it's the architecture of our world. It's the, uh, it's the plumbing, it's, that the, everything that's underwritten, everything that we can do, say, buy, sell, uh, all our relationships and interactions are really uh, underpinned and underwritten by law. So I think you're right, it is a fascinating topic. Seeing as, it would, as this would differ across culture, cultures, yes. Well, as Lu Lucille was pointing out in her presentation, Legal Systems of Asia and Africa, which is our key signature SOAS course for undergraduates, will give you an, a foray or an entrance into really thinking about that and how a plurality of different legal cultures and legal systems understand the law. And also, as Lucia mentioned, the, the role of colonialism in the creation of law and legal systems and how a Western, a, a Western perspective has really underpinned so many of the systems today. Harry, it is the most fascinating way that business are affected. Mm -hmm. 
and changes in the law from, from the trust bus to modern monopolies. Ah, yes, you've been watching, no doubt, then recent court, hearing, uh, court hearings and also uh, Senate hearings in the United States in, in that respect. And undoubtedly, you've seen Facebook on trial to some extent in the public media, if not uh, yet in the court system. So Hill says, I find law incredibly interesting as it allows us to help people around us in various ways, ways, yes. And I feel helping people is something I have always wanted to do. And law seems like an incredible and exciting way to do it. Yeah, I completely agree with you as somebody who worked in a number of different legal settings prior to becoming a legal scholar. Uh, I started out my legal career at Allen and Overy LLP as a corporate lawyer of all things. I soon realized after a few years there that that was not my path in life uh, and moved into monitoring war crimes trials and then subsequently working with the United Nations and a number of non-governmental NGOs, uh, non-governmental organizations in West Africa and Southeast Asia. And it, 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 law really opened all those doors for me. It enabled me to pursue uh, work and to pursue a career across the globe uh, and situate myself in exactly doing exactly that or trying to do that. Um, of course, I was very critical of the role of the United Nations after, after time having worked in the system, but I still believe that fundamentally law can be used as an instrument to speak truth to power and as an instrument of social change. So I think you, you, you're absolutely um, on the right track, Sahil, in, in wanting to do law for those reasons. Excellent. Well, I might let Lucia leave us because she has to teach and I know that she's very kindly joined us for her big idea to present to you this and as I think she was really speaking to a lot of the things that you've mentioned in the chat there with respect to how SOAS sees the role of um, our, our law program and law students, wouldn't you say, Lucia? Lucia? Yes, definitely. Thank you, Michelle. It's, it's, it's always really interesting from looking at particularly how law is thought of SOAS from, let's say, my own undergraduate experience in law, studying law in the Netherlands. It was, it was a complete change. So I teach one of the core modules here, which is legal systems of Asia and Africa. And one of the feedbacks that we always get from students is that it's, it's such a challenging course, but it's also something that they've never been introduced to before. So it's always a really, it's an interesting journey for them to understanding how not only law affects our own society, but particularly how we view law affects different parts of the world. So if you're thinking of studying law, so this is one of the aspects of the things that you will be introduced to, particularly viewing how different groups in our society are often marginalized within the context of law, even without us realizing, right? Because we see law as a marker for social change. We see law often as something positive, but it can also have negative influences in society. And these are aspects of the law that we often don't particularly look at. So it's good to understand not only how law is created and how law has an effect on our interactions, but particularly how law is still very much rooted in this idea of um, colonialism and civilizing different parts of the world. So it's an important aspect of understanding what law ought to be made. So I'm really happy that you are all very much interested for all the right reasons in studying law. So great. And it was great meeting you. Excellent. Thank you so much, Lucia. And yeah, we're, we're, we're really happy to hear all these, these various points of view. Um, and as a good cross-section there too, I can see that some of you are interested in the topic itself, you're fascinated by law, some of you want to go and work with corporates possibly, um, to see how business um, can be, is affected by law in so many ways, and then and many of you also wanting to uh, see law as an instrument of so social change. So I suppose now that we've had our big idea moment, um, I thought I would spend just five to 10 minutes explaining the law program at SOAS to you. And then I'll open up the floor for questions in case anybody has any burning questions they want to ask about what's offered at SOAS, uh, how we structure our undergraduate program, and also if there are any questions with respect to the presentation that Lucia gave with respect to inter intersectionality or any other concepts. So let me just share my screen now.
Well, the first thing to say to all of you is congratulations. I think it's a fantastic time to be thinking about studying law. Law is uh, arguably the most important, continues to be the most important uh, subject to study, given its importance and significance in how society functions and operates. Um, it's increasingly moving, as we see, from an understanding of law and legal relations that are very local or parochial, uh, very much about relationships in the country where you're from. So in England and here in the United Kingdom, you'd be studying the law of England and Wales in an English university, to a much more international focus, understanding the cross-border relationships between different countries and with uh, the Paris Agreement being somewhat renegotiated and thought through again, uh, next month at the Climate Change Conference in Glasgow, of course, at COP26, we see on the front page of newspapers nearly every day something in relation to uh, how the impact of law and, and legal uh, relations here in the UK has an effect on the globe, on carbon emissions globally and the reduction of carbon emissions. And ultimately, law has become global. Law is um, very much seen now as uh, regulating uh, transactional flows on the one hand uh, and relations, human relations between people from all corners of the world through both um, its presence uh, in relation to uh, the virtual world as well as the world in real life. So what then is the role of the lawyer in the 21st century and why might you want to be studying law at, the, at this point in, in history? Well, I think that law has really become uh, you, you're moving from becoming an interlocutor in between parties, engaging in negotiations or relationships to, to come to an agreement as a contract lawyer traditionally would have, to also becoming a change maker and a defender. Increasingly, we see some of the most important people in history have in fact been lawyers. Everything, everyone from Ho Chi Minh to uh, Che Guevara to Rosa Luxemburg to name a few from last century. And of course, uh, even, even today, many of, of the, the, the people who are making headlines in the news themselves have studied, studied law. From SOAS, of course, our uh, glory, our SOAS alumni, uh, David Lammy, who's now a politician, uh, studied law with us here. And law underwrites really every relationship in society. It's the fabric that holds society together. And here at SOAS, we want you to start thinking of law differently. When we think of law in the ordinary sense, we think of it as governing political communities or more often than not known as states. When we look at a map, we think this is a fairly traditional map of the world. And we look at these various entities and we think of law as being different in each of those countries but essentially being about governing those communities. But at SOAS, we want to start questioning the way we see this map. Why is it that we divide the world in this way? What is it that cartographers are trying to tell us when they make certain states larger than others, for instance? What if we saw the world instead in terms of its population size? Wouldn't then China and India be more prominent in our understanding of the globe. And certainly wouldn't the countries of the global south, which is uh, just a World Bank term for what is really the majority of the world, be more at the fore of our thinking than other countries? And what if we were to see the, the world from the perspective of the global south and think of the world in terms of the global south and, and flip our views? This is an upside down world map, but is it really upside down? Who is it that really now uh, is, is of significance in our thinking about law and legal relations? Should it be just us here in the United Kingdom, in England and Wales, or should we be thinking much more globally? In a situation as we confront now a global pandemic with, with COVID-19, isn't it becoming more obvious than ever that the world is interconnected, that there isn't an out there and an in here, but in fact, we are all interconnected and engaged in keeping this planet, sustaining this planet together. Could we see it as both not only a science and a cartographer's map, but also an art 
as Pierre Mondrian did in the interwar period in his understanding of the map of the world, or as Julie Meretu does in her understanding of global spaces today. At SOAS, we want you to see the world not simply as um, it's been taught to you traditionally, but to think through both imaginatively, creatively, and scientifically and rationally how law operates and what that means for the globe and the planet as we understand it today. So why study law at SOAS then? Well, I can give you at least 21 or so reasons. At SOAS, you'll be joining a community of scholar practitioners, all of whom themselves have been involved in processes of social change across the globe, be it fighting resistance uh, and engaged in resistance movements in Palestine, to uh, fighting for LGBTQIA rights in the plus, QIA plus rights in the India Supreme Court, uh, to uh, special rapporteurs for Sudan, uh, to investment arbitration and in the Pan-African context. What you'll get here is a group of scholars that are deeply committed, not only to ensuring that their scholarship is rigorous and original, but that it really reflects the panoply of understandings of law from across the globe. And it's this diversity of, our, of perspectives that we think really sets us apart as a school and as a community. It's the fact that we don't stop and simply see law as a parochial endeavor in England. We see it as really about relations across the world. But more than us, I think what you're coming for is your peers. And here you see they don't look particularly happy at their graduation. I think there must have been a, some kind of a boring speech going on or possibly one that was talking about deep issues because a lot of them look very serious. But what you can see from this group is the diversity of student life at SOAS. We have students coming to SOAS to do undergraduate law from all across the, the, low, the growth all across the globe, from Asia, the Middle East and North Africa, and um, also in our, in our postgraduate degrees as well. They look a little bit happier there, so I thought I should share that one with you. Um, so what will you be, be studying if you come and join us here? Well, of course, the most prominent or, or a primary um, undergraduate program that we have is the LLB degree which looks something like this. In your first year, you will study uh, four compulsory subjects in, in addition to introduction to law and legal processes, which is the first two weeks of your course. The way a law degree is structured is essentially it's 120 credit points per year. And to give you a sense of what that means, a full year subject is 30 credit points. So 120 credit points is essentially four subjects. But if you do two half subjects, then it could be six or eight, depending on the year you're in. In your first year, we take you through with some depth and rigor, the, the primary subjects required to obtain a law degree and to be a practicing lawyer in England and Wales, namely criminal law, contract law, property law, and public law. But then in your second year, uh, in addition to doing taught law, EU law and, and property law too, or trusts, you will also do legal systems of Asia and Africa, which as Lucia was mentioning, is really about understanding law in its global context and its international context, and being able to see how systems of those um, uh, states and countries across the globe have really interacted with the law of England and Wales amongst others. We then also get to choose either one full year subject or two half year subjects of your own. And there's a vast majority or a wide range of subjects you can choose, which uh, are available for viewing on our website. But it can be anything from international commercial arbitration to uh, um, the art of advocacy to international law, international human rights law, refugee law, uh, environmental law, uh, law, law and society in South Asia, amongst other subjects. And then in your third year, you really get to choose um, the whole range of subjects in, in terms of options. So it'll be all, all in terms of really where you see yourself going post SOAS. 
If you're more interested in going into the commercial world, then there'll be a number of corporate and commercial subjects you could choose. If you're more, more interested in social justice, you may choose various um, options in relation to international law or international human rights law. And you are also able to choose a subject from a non SOAS from one of the University of London schools, so not SOAS in other words. So we've had, for example, students go and do tax law at UCL. Um, as long as the subject is not currently available at SOAS, you are able to go and do that subject um, in, the, uh, in the college of your choice, it's provided it's a University of London college. I'm just checking. Okay, just wanted to check who was chatting, that's fine. Welcome, Noshin. Um, additionally, in addition to our LLB, we also have an LLB degree with a year abroad, which essentially means you're doing the law degree, but you also opt to take a year abroad at one of our partner institutions. At the moment, we have partner institutions in Thailand, Singapore, and India, and we're also um, likely to have more partner institutions by the time you join us next year. We're looking at um, institutions currently in New York and also in Turkey. Um, so do get in touch with us if you're particularly interested in going and studying abroad as part of your LLB degree. There's also something known as the senior status degree. So if any of you have already undertaken an undergraduate degree that wasn't a law degree, and you want to now convert that or, or come and study law on top of having done a BA in politics or a, a science degree in chemistry, you can do the law degree in two years as a condensed two year course, um, which essentially means that you're doing the same number of subjects, but you're doing it in a shorter amount of time. And that degree really focuses on the core subjects because in order to become a barrister in England and Wales, it's important to have done um, an LLB degree as at your undergraduate level. And then finally, there's also the BA law degree. This is a bachelor in another subject at SOAS. So you might do economics and then do some law subjects as part of um, a part of that BA course. And um, it's not a, a, at present, it would not qualify you to be a barrister. Although with respect to the solicitors qualifying exam, which some of you may already be aware of, essentially what's happened with the Law Society of England and Wales is that they've now brought in an exam which is the only requirement for um, practicing lawyers to, be, to become solicitors in England and Wales. So as of next year, there'll be a transitioning uh, for solicitors away from the LLB in the sense that you won't have to do a law degree in order to qualify as a solicitor. You, you will just simply need to pass um, SQE1 and SQE2. So one option could be if you're not entirely sure that you want to do an LLB, you're not really sure if you're interested in the core subjects, you're more interested in law as a ph the philosophy of law and law as a broader option, uh, you could do a BA law in which you choose from a number of law subjects and you don't have to do all seven of the core subjects, you just do criminal contract law and legal systems of Asia and Africa. And then you can choose from a wider range of subjects at SOAS in other departments um, as part of that degree. Um, so careers after SOAS then, just to let you know, a recent survey found that SOAS law graduates were ranked as the sec second highest paid solicitors in the UK, which came as somewhat of a surprise to us here at SOAS, um, but apparently we were ahead of Oxford, Cambridge and King's College in that chamber's survey. Um, in terms of what I think sets you, sets you apart as a SOAS graduate, and here I've got, of course, David Lammy uh, on the right of the screen, is essentially your in-depth knowledge and understanding of law in both its local and global context. And what we're really aiming to have at the end of your three years is you'll have a strong capacity to think critically and as such become thought leaders in your various uh, professions, be it whether you choose to become a solicitor or you decide to go somewhere else, work for a company or for a non-governmental organization. And I think really Luc Lucia hit the nail on the head when she was talking about the notion of intersectional experience and intersectionality. 
um, we, as SOAS graduates and as, as SOAS scholars, it's fundamentally important to us that we understand that the experience that of those who are at the, the uh, other end of the, the legal system, be it um, those who are faced with charges in the criminal justice system, be it um, those who are the, uh, suffering at, at the result of austerity measures in the current government, uh, we want to look at how law affects the, the, the most vulnerable in society and how what we can do then to secure greater rights for those parties. But even if you don't agree with that perspective, if you actually take a different point of view, you're much more of a doctrinal lawyer, you will be given the skills to think critically at SOAS and you will be able to ask those questions of yourself and be reflexive about how you're um, defending your clients or representing your clients. And I think that's really important and what employers increasingly um, find appealing about SOAS graduates is that intellectual capacity um, to think critically about the issues and about law in its current context. So here's just a number of, of our alumni to give you a sense of who's been to SOAS in the past. And I'll stop sharing there and see whether there are any questions or concerns from that presentation. We're at 11.45 now, so we have about 10 minutes to go um, if there are any questions. Was it clear first and foremost? Oh, thanks, Yasmin. That's very kind. <laughs> Amazing. I'm, I'm hoping it makes you want to come. We're looking forward to, to having you. Very informative. Great. Well, if there, are there any questions or concerns at this point? Are people thinking of coming to do the LLB? Or are you more thinking you want to do a BA law or something else? Yeah, LLB with your year abroad, Harry. I think that's a great option uh, and really a great way to experience another country and culture's law degree, which is very different in different parts of the world. Uh, personally, I have a lot of friends who are now scholars and practitioners in Indonesia and Phnom Penh in Cambodia, and both their, their teaching is very different to mine. So it's always good to have those discussions about how we teach and what the degree is like for the students. Yasmin, yes, absolutely. I mean, anthropology as a, as a field is absolutely so fascinating. Uh, in, in another life, I might've been an ethnographic field worker going out to understand how different um, cultures across the globe um, uh, uh, work or, or how what makes people tick. I think if you're interested both in um, how both, I guess, both the, the, the way in which um, societies are governed and then also how different cultures understand governance, that would be a really great combination. Um, and certainly at undergraduate level, you know, you can, you can do, undertake a lot of different paths at the same time, I think, expand your mind and broaden your horizons. Something like anthropology and law will give you a lot of scope to decide from there where you want to go with your with your working life anyone else uh, we have yes no shin did you have any we've also got a student here a current law student at soas so do you want to maybe have a few words seeing as they don't have quite have any questions at the moment but it might be good for you to just tell them your experience of soas law and how how it's been for you so hi everyone, um, my name is Noshin. I'm currently a third year student at SOAS. Um, I've had an amazing time so far and I'm glad to be back in person for my third year. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, please let me know if you have any questions that I'd be happy to answer from a student's perspective and just to give you a bit of background information as to the modules that I've um, studied so far. I've done the core modules, so property, criminal, contract, all of those ones, 
and the modules that I've chosen to study have been, um, I did a module in Arabic um, and this year, I did my module in Arabic last year and this year I'm studying environmental law, um, alternative dispute resolution, family law, law and society in South Asia, a history module, um, and the last one has slipped my mind. Um, but yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions if anybody has any. Okay, so the first question is, why did you pick SOAS and what has it been like to study with SOAS? So I picked SOAS because, um, because of the, like, I think um, Lucia and Michelle did touch upon this earlier, but they really teach law in a very unique way and give you an insight into how law is practiced across the world. Um, I took the module Legal Systems of Asia and Africa last year and it was really, really interesting. And it's probably one of the reasons that I chose to study law and society in South Asia this year, um, it, which is probably so far one of my favorite modules. It really gives you an insight into, um, into uh, different cultures, um, different ways of life and um, yeah, I've just found that really interesting. Um, I've also found that the student body is really, really diverse at SOAS. Um, like Michelle said, there are genuinely people from all over the world, and it's so, so interesting to be able to speak to them and meet them and hear their perspectives in class and things like that. It really makes debates and things really, really interesting. And my final reason would probably be, uh, but I've always wanted to study Arabic, and this degree gave me it's at so as um the law degree gave, gave me the option to have an insight into Arabic not sure how good I am but it, it was really nice to study it um and yeah as I mentioned it has been a really really great experience I don't think I would I, I really truly do feel like so as was the university for me I hope that answered the question thank you so much Noshin are there any other questions either for Noshin or myself? We're happy to. Well, here we are. Where so, are do you think that studying law as well as the language was useful? Um, so, I did take the beginners Arabic. You do get to, um, you know, if you have already do have a degree of proficiency in a language, you can take the, uh, you know, a more advanced class. So, I took beginners Arabic. It did give me a very good insight um, and it has it did motivate me to car carry on taking classes outside of South Africa because I'm not sure how much I want to be graded on my Arabic anymore but um, it was very very helpful in that it really developed that passion of mind for languages and it does come across as quite impressive I think to to employers when you say that you um, you of studying another language or that you are proficient in another language it, is, it has been something that I've mentioned in a couple of interviews and things like that yeah if you want to work for the UN for example for the United Nations having proficiency in a, in a second language is one of the UN languages Arabic Chinese French Spanish um, or Russian is of course important, um, but then also for a number of other careers and pathways as well. I think it's can just open up a number of different doors um, in, in both settings, both in the non-governmental setting, the governmental and also um, in the commercial setting. So really depends on, on you and, and where you see yourself going. Excellent. Any other questions or shall we leave it there for now? Well, I'll put my email address here anyway, in case anyone has any further concerns or questions after today's session. And Nasheen has very kindly agreed to answer questions as well. So I don't know if you can give them your address yet. And then that way, if there is any burning questions afterward that you think, oh, I should have asked them that, um, please do get in touch. We're happy to always to be, um, to be helpful and, and to answer questions. Um, I think that's one of the things I like about most at SOAS. It's very much a community feel, and it's very much about an open door policy. Everybody is, is um, here to, to, to be a part of the community and part of the group. And I think it's in part because we're quite a small school 
Uh, at the moment, I think we're around 5,800 students, which is quite small, small comparatively. But the benefit of being that size is that you really get the sense that people are a part of the community and part of that culture of, of um, caring and, and looking after each other. So, great. All right. Thank you so much, everybody. Um, I might then let us leave the room for today, I think, because we've we probably have to make way for the next session. Some of you may be joining the next one. I think it's finances on next in the room in case anybody's also thinking of becoming a, an investment banker <laughs> uh, or, or using finance in their careers. Um, otherwise, I think we can say goodbye and uh, wish you all the best for your career paths and I hope to see you at SOAS um, next year.